want to invite you to open up your Bibles to uh, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1. Uh, I'm going to go from Matthew 1 to Romans 8, and then I'm going to come back to, um, to Matthew 1. Um, but if you just go to Matthew 1, you're fine. Matthew 1, Romans 8, then we're going to go to Mark chapter 10, and then we're going to finish in Romans, Romans chapter 3 um, more specifically. So if you get to Matthew 1, you'll be good. Uh, first of all, I want to tell you Merry Christmas. We are now in December, and, and I want to wish you all a Merry Christmas. Um, I know that you guys are preparing to buy your uh, family uh, gifts, and um, my only advice is don't wait till the last minute, because the only thing you're going to find at CVS on the 24th is probably candy. All right, you know, so anyways, um, I know from experience. Um, but uh, over the next uh, few weeks, today I'm going to be sharing with you um, gifts that God has for you. And today I'm going to share with you um, the gift of salvation. Uh, next week, um, we're going to honor those families that have lost a loved one in the last two years. Um, I'm going to teach over the gift of heaven. And then um, the following week, uh, right before Christmas, I, I want to teach over the gift of peace. And um, hopefully we can find peace um, with our own families um, as we prepare to celebrate um, Christmas. Um, so I, I was like thinking <clears throat> uh, last night, I was like, man, what, what's like a story or like a Christmas memory I can share with, um, with the church um, before I get into the teaching? And, and I don't know, I just thought about last night something that I'm sure that many of you experience. Um, in our house, when we, we exchange gifts, we usually start from youngest to oldest. So the youngest open their gifts and we work our way all the way up to, to my dad. And... Um, it's really funny because, you know, as the, we're opening gifts, especially when we were kids, we're opening those gifts, and then it says, like, mom and dad, right? And I notice that every time the gift says, like, mom and dad, my dad's always, like, just real concentrated, like, on, on what, we're, what we're opening. He's just, like, staring, right? And then um, uh, we open it, and we're like, oh, thank you, mom, and we'll hug, like, my mom and, and hug my dad, and he's just kind of, like, and I'm pretty sure that's, like, the first time he's ever seen that. Like, he has, like, no idea what my mom buys us. It just says from mom and dad, but I, I think it's just more from mom and dad gave her the credit card. Or I don't know, you know, something, something should be more like along those lines, what the lines should, what the little card should say. But anyways, um, and every once in a while, he'll even ask my mom, we bought that? You know, like that. And I, I guess that, that probably think, means that he thinks it costs too much. I don't know whenever he asks that. But um, anyway, just thought I'd share that with you. Uh, Matthew chapter 1, let's go ahead and read uh, verse 18. Matthew 1 verse 18 says, this is how Jesus, the Messiah, was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, that means that they had not known each other intimately, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. I love the way it says that. She became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. The, the birth of Jesus is a miraculous birth. All right, the birth of Jesus is a miracle in itself. He, may, he, he gets it started with, with a bang, right? Like man, a, a, a miracle, right? Verse 19 says, Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man. What type of man was Joseph? Let's try that again. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man. What type of man was Joseph? A righteous man. And did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. Man, let's, let's think about this real quick. This has nothing to do really with my teaching, but I, I think that in today's day and age, it's important that we would, we would think about this verse. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. In the day of social media, right? In the day of Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, YouTube, whatever, where people are putting people on blast, where people are, are exposing people for, for every little thing, but they don't want to be put on blast and they don't want to be exposed. In the age of social media, it shows here that Joseph was a righteous man and he did not put Mary on blast. Right. That Joseph was a righteous man and he, he didn't post it online. If, if social media would have existed, then he, he wouldn't have put it on. Man, you know, this this girl right here, she tried to do me wrong. Right. You know, like I mean, he, he didn't put none of that online. He was just a righteous man. So he's like, you know what? Let's just let's just break things off. And, and quietly you go left. I'm going to go right. You go north. I'm going to go south. You go east. I'm going to go. I mean, let's just, you know, you know, and keep it on the down low. Right. He, he, he didn't have to, I mean, I, I think there's a lot to learn there. May, may, uh, so I don't know, just wanted to put a little emphasis on that. Verse 20. 
As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. 21. And she will have a son, and you will name him, what will they name him? Jesus, for he will, everybody together, for he will save, one more time, Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Verse 22. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through the prophet. 23. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and they will call him. Well, what will be his name? According to the prophet Emmanuel, which means what does it mean? God is with us. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the privilege and the opportunity of once again Come into your house of worship, be in with the hermanos, be in with the brothers, praising you, worshiping you, and now preparing to receive from your word. Lord, prepare, prepare the ground, our hearts and our minds to receive your word. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to believe and have faith. And if there's a spirit of disturbance that tries to come against us to stop your word from taking grasp of our hearts, we bind and rebuke such spirits and we send it to those places that are lonesome and void that you are prepared. And then, Father, I pray on behalf of myself, I'm your servant, as that you would give me the words, the wisdom I need to bring a message that will be a blessing to us all, as that you would give me grace and favor before the hermanos and above that, give me grace and favor before you. Finally, Lord, I ask for a fresh unction. Fill us all with your Holy Spirit. Help us to learn to depend more and more on your power. In Jesus' name we pray, in the name of Jesus, amen, amen, amen. Let's give the Lord some praise as we prepare to get into the message. Verse 22 once again says, All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. That means that God had given a pro prophecy, there was prophetic word. Verse 23, look the virgin will conceive a child, she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Uh, Bible scholars believe that there are over 300 prophecies concerning Jesus in the Old Testament. Over 300 prophecies concerning Jesus in the Old Testament. Um, hundreds of years, in some cases thousands of years, before Jesus was born, God was already given prophetic word of what all he had placed, uh, what all he was doing, how he's working in, 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 the, in the history of, of the world, the history of mankind to come to this moment, to this point of the virgin birth of Jesus and then his death and resurrection and then us today who are blessed because without seeing, we believe in what he has done. Right? Um, you know, I, I, when I think of prophecies, I, I think of early on, the days of Adam and Eve, when God tells Adam and Eve, like, don't eat from that tree, the tree of wisdom of good and evil, because the day you eat of that tree, surely you'll die. And when they ate, one of the first things that happened was that Adam and Eve, when they disobeyed, they, their eyes were open and they realized that they were, they were naked. And, 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 um, and so they tried to cover themselves with leaves. And then God came and the Bible says that God covered them with skins. And so uh, that helps us understand that some innocent animals shed their blood to cover the sins of Adam and Eve. And when Jesus came um, to this world, John the Baptist saw Jesus and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. And Jesus, like one of those innocent animals, shed his blood to cover our sins. I mean, from the very beginning of, of humanity, God was already pointing to Jesus. Now, why is it important that you and I would understand that hundreds, in some cases thousands of years before the birth of Christ, um, God was already preparing us for his coming uh, for two reasons. One is that we do not serve a God of chance, all right? We, we, don't, we, don't, we don't serve a, a God of chance. I say it all the time, like, what are the chances? But the, the real thing is that we don't serve a God of chance, all right? We don't serve a, a God of, of um, 
uh, man, isn't that crazy? Like that, um, I mean, what, 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 what are the odds, right? We want to serve a God of, 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 of odds, right? You know, this is not the Hunger Games. May, may the odds forever be in your favor, right? You know, like we want to serve a God of odds. We, we serve a God of purpose. We serve a God uh, who has a plan, right? We, we serve a God who has a will, we serve a God who is sovereign, who, who, who is in control, who has power, who has authority, and he knows what he's doing. Right? That's something that's hard for us to realize, but God knows what he's doing, and then I'll let you in on the final secret. We serve a God that loves you and loves you very, very much. Right? You serve a God that loves you, and he loves you very, very much. Right? And so God, God has, let me tell you, God has a purpose for you. Now, the other thing is that if we see that everything in history is happening because God is ordaining it, right? Like all the things that happened hundreds, thousands of years before the birth of Christ, God had ordained it working up to that moment of the birth and then later his death and resurrection. It shows us that God isn't this God that's like really far and he has nothing to do with us, right? Like some people believe that. They believe like God is like on the other side of the sun and every once in a while he just kind of pops his head in the world and maybe if I'm really good, he might pop his head in my world, right? No, 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 that, that's, that's not the God that you serve. There, there's a, there, there's a, a little saying that some people say and it's history is history, right? History is his story. And so really God is always involved in, 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 in man's business. He's always involved in, in our lives and, and in our world. And so just like we understand that hundreds, thousands of years before the birth of Christ, God was preparing things. I want you to know something. God was preparing you for this moment. Right? Now, you may think, like, well, I came to church because, well, I mean, Sunday, traditionally, we go to church. You may think, like, well, I went to church because someone invited me to church. You may think, well, I came to church because someone dragged me to church, right? You know, maybe not literally, but someone, you know, nudged you and pushed you uh, to come to church. But let me tell you, the reason that you're here is because God has a plan and a purpose for you. And everything that has happened in your life, whether it's good or bad, let me tell you that God is working it for your good. He, he's going to work it. He's going to, man, it's like tamales. We're in tamales season right now, right? Any hermanas here make tamales? Te encargo media de No, I'm just kidding, right? No, no, no te encargo media. But, you know, my mom makes tamales, and um, I've seen her make the masa, and they don't look too appealing when they're like, yeah. I, I've seen her when she makes the, the meat, and, and, you know, when you first see the meat raw, that doesn't look appealing. Right. Then the, the, the red pepper and the spices, you know, whatever they, they, they put in it. None of that on its own is appealing. Right. But when it's all mixed together and then it, you know, sits there in that, that pot. And then, you know, when she opens it and that, that steam comes up and that smell of tamales, like, you know, takes over the household. And then I'm a real Chicano. When you eat it with ketchup. If you ain't tried it, don't knock it, is all I got to say. That's all I got to say, man. But I'll tell you, us Chicanos, we know. We know what's up, right? And so I, I, know, I know all the guys in prison are like, that's right, pastor. You know, they, 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 and so <laughs> anyway, it's a, it's a thing. If you've never had tamales with ketchup, all I got to say is you ain't living. You ain't, you ain't really had tamales till you've had it with ketchup. But anyway, all right, all right I digress. But um, all of that, man. It all works together. Right? Let, let me tell you what Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know, we don't think, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Now I'm going to ask a question and y'all pay attention, all right? Is there anyone here that loves God? Let me ask it again. Is there anyone here that loves God? Amen. All right. Man, I'm going to tell y'all, man, at the service at 8 a.m., there was like three of us. <laughs> I don't know. No tuvieron su café. They didn't have their coffee or what. No eran dormidos or something. I was like, I love God here. Right? So if you love God, know. All right? 
You don't have to think, there's no doubt. No, that God is using everything to work together. Everything means the good and the bad. The good and the bad, God is using it all. He's working it, all right? He's working it for your good and for his purpose. Verse 29 says, for God, what does it say? Knew his people in advance. God knew you in advance, all right? God didn't meet you when you first came to church. <gasps> nice to meet you. <laughs> God didn't meet you when you first came. God did not meet you when someone first told you about Jesus. Before you were born, God already knew you. Es más, before the foundations of the world, God already knew you. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose you, predestined you, is what some Bibles will say. And he predestined them to become like his son so that his son would be the for firstborn among many brothers and sisters. You know, we don't say it so much in, in the English, but, but in, in Spanish, we refer to each other as hermanos, right? Which means brothers, right? Hey, el hermano Garza, el hermano González, and that's how we say hermanos. Well, some of y'all have more primos than hermanos, but anyway, I'll, I'll touch that later. But... Um, <laughs> You know, hermanos, right, brothers? It's not that, that like, just me and you are brothers. No, we are brothers because God is using everything in your life. He called you in advance. He knew you in, in advance. He called you to become like his son so that you would become a brother to Christ. And because you are a brother and sister to Christ and I am a brother to Christ, then that makes us familia, right? That makes us brothers, right? Verse 30 says, and having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. All right. God has chosen you. All right. Or another way of saying it is that God has predestined you. All right. He already knew you. And because he knew you, he chose you. You're here not out of coincidence, but you are here because the God of purpose knew you before you knew him, chose you before you knew him, and gave you right standing. In other words, he has justified you. Right? Gave you right standing with himself, and having given you right standing, he has given you his glory. What does this mean? Okay. That God is working in your life. Right? And everything that has happened to you and everything that will happen to you, God is like throwing it in the masa. Right? And he is preparing it because he will be glorified in your life. The devil might try to take you out, but God will lift you up because he will be glorified in your life. He called you out a long time ago. He predestined you for this moment. He predestined you for this moment. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And no matter what the enemy has done, you will be victorious. God will be glorified in your life. Your story is God's story. Your story is God's story. Right? Your life is, is God's story in your life. Your life, my life, it's all about what God is doing in my life. And let me tell you that he didn't create you to be a loser, right? He created you to be victorious. The enemy tries to rewrite the ending. He, he can't rewrite the ending because the ending has been written. And the ending is that in Jesus Christ, you win. You win. So no matter what the devil throws at you, you need to know that in the end, because of Jesus Christ, you win. I need somebody to be thankful for that. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. And she, she will have a son, and you are to name his son Jesus, for he will save his people from sin. Jesus, the name Jesus means Savior, right? The name Jesus means Savior. So you call his name Jesus because he will save his people, right? Jesus, the Savior, came to save. 
verse 23. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So Jesus means Savior. Emmanuel means God is with us. Who came to save us? God himself. All right. Who came to save us? God himself. Uh, yesterday, I was, I was getting ready because we had a, a graduation in the morning, and um, there, there's like no water in the house. I'm like, I tell my wife, because they're, they're fixing our street, so um, they shut off the water regularly, but they put a, a They'll leave us a note telling us, hey, tomorrow from this time to this time, we're going to shut off the water. And I told Naeli, I'm like, babe, they shut off the water and they didn't even warn us. And she's like, well, there was just water right now. I'm like, I don't know. Well, I went outside and, um, and uh, the, the guy that was, uh, he, the yard guy was there at the house. He had busted a, a pipe and he busted a pipe. So all the water was coming out and he was like trying to turn it off at the main, but he didn't have the, the right tool. So I'm like, uh, come on. I'm like, no, 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 I, I have a disconnect. I'm like, just, just disconnect it, right? So because the way the pipe was that he busted, he couldn't fix it. And, 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 and the guys that worked for us, uh, they were far. So I called a friend of mine, Pastor Jorge Paz. And I'm like, Jorge, and I, I sent him a picture. I'm like, can you come and fix this? And he goes, I'll be there within the hour. And I'm like, okay. So Jorge comes, and he's out there working, you know, fixing this pipe. It, luckily, it was outside. And so I'm out there, you know. I, I, I'm, I'm out there, you know. It's kind of like I tell my friends, like, hey, man, your car ever breaks down, call me. And they're always like, oh, you're a mechanic? I'm like, no, I just want to know, you know. Like, I'm I just... <laughs> just <laughs> I'll pray for you, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have a good time. We'll laugh or something, right? So just give me a call. Your car ever breaks down, you know, like I'm, I'm not going to be any help, but, you know, I'll be like, uh, maybe we need to rotate the tires. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why it doesn't turn on. And so, um, so anyway, so, so I'm there. I said, le platica Jorge, right? We're talking and, and laughing. And so, of course, Rebecca and Raquel, they want to be out there too because I'm outside, right? And, Re and Rebecca's telling um, Jorge, um, I, I don't have my hammer because I left it at mama's house, right? You know, so she couldn't help because she didn't have her hammer because she left it at her grandma's house, right? That was, that was the translation. And so he's like, it's okay, I have a hammer, right? And uh, so anyway, so somehow it comes up in conversation that uh, Nayeli's pregnant and we're expecting a, our third baby um, in April. And so he's like, oh, he's like, my daughter, Laura, she's pregnant. And I was like, well, when's the baby doing? He's like, in, in this month, December. And I'm like, oh, do they know if it's going to be a boy or a girl? And he goes, yeah, it's going to be a boy. And I'm like, I just like to bother, mess with people, right? Picarles, as we say. I'm like, are they going to name him Jorge? Right? Because the grandpa, Jorge Paz, are they going to name him Jorge? And he's like, no. <laughs> he's like, I told my daughter all the beautiful meanings of Jorge, <laughs> but they're going to name, I don't remember what, what he told me they were going to name the baby. And I'm like, it's all right, we'll pray that on the second one, they name him Jorge. I, I, man, I like that. I like, you know, like Jorge knows the meaning of his name. I, I like it. I'm not a big fan of like people be making up names for their kids and, and, and there's like no meaning. I'm, I'm a fan of like a, a name with a meaning, right? Or, or a reason, you know, like, like I like when people are like, oh yeah, you know, this is, you know, uh, I like when it's like, you know, this is John Paul the fourth. I'm like, watch out the fourth, man. That's a story, man. Four generations of John Pauls, right? And, and what's his nickname? Cuatro. Man, I love that, you know, like that. Like, I love that. Hey, Cuatro, ven pa' acá, you know, like that. Man, I love that, you know. Like, I like when there's a meaning, something like that, right? And when you read the Bible, you'll see that pretty much all the names have a meaning. There, there's a reason that people are named certain things. For instance, Abraham. Now, Abraham means like father of multitudes, right? And, and Abraham and his wife, Sarah, they're, they're old. Like, they're, they're old, and, and they're in their 90s. And God comes and tells Abraham, Abraham, you, you're going to be a, you and Sarah, you're going to have a boy, and you're going to have a great descendant, right? And, and so Abraham, as you know the story, had Isaac, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob, the 12 tribes. And then today, there are nations and, and, and um, millions of people that are descendants of Abraham, Abraham, father of multitudes, father of nations. Isaac, so when Sarah heard the Lord tell Abraham, hey, you and Sarah are going to have a baby, Sarah laughed. Sarah laughed, she's like, with this old man? You know, like she laughed. And God asked Sarah, like, Sarah, why'd you laugh? She's like, I didn't laugh. And he's like, yes, you did laugh. <laughs> so then what did they do? They named the baby Isaac. And what does Isaac mean? It means laughter or he who laughs, right? Because they laughed. And then Isaac had two sons. They were twins. And one of the sons' name was Jacob. And Jacob means a supplanter. It means like someone who like, like removes someone and takes their spot. And what did he do? He stole the birthright and the blessings of his older brother. And he flees because his brother wants to kill him. 
And years later, when he's ready to come back, he has an encounter with God, and he tells God, God bless me. And God blesses him by changing his name. And he says, you'll no longer be called Jacob. You'll be called Israel. And Israel means prince, right? And so he became like royalty with his 12 sons and then their families and where we get the 12 tribes of Israel. Man, those names, they mean something. The name of Jesus means something. Verse 21, you will call him Jesus because he will save his people. The name Jesus means savior. It, it could have said, and uh, you are to name him savior for he will save his people from their sins. Verse 23, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Jesus means, uh, uh, Jesus, his name is Emmanuel as well, and Emmanuel meaning God is with us. Uh, we're, we're in, in uh, you know, a little bit different, right? In the Spanish services, we say Feliz Navidad, uh, but uh, we, we, say, we say here, what do we say here? Feliz Navidad as well, thank you. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we also say Merry Christmas, right? You know, Merry Christmas. And um, Christmas is composed of the root word, Christ, right? Christ. And so, you know, Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, the birth of the Christ. Here it said, the, you know, the Messiah. Right? Christ is the Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah. And what it means, it means anointed one. And in the Old Testament, there were three, three, three groups that were anointed. The prophets were anointed, the priests were anointed, and the kings were anointed. Right? They, they were the leaders, the spiritual leaders of the, of the people and God's representatives for the people. And so Jesus, he's not just the Savior, but Jesus Christ, which is his full name, Christ Jesus, his, his, his name and title. He's not just the Savior, but he is the anointed Savior. Right? That means that he is the official Savior that God has sent. Right? Uh, man, I'm sorry, Mohammed. I'm sorry, Buddha. I'm sorry, anybody else. I'm sorry, churches. I'm sorry, religions. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There, there's only one official Savior. There's only one official way that you and I can be saved from hell and from damnation. And he has a name. His name is Jesus Christ. Oh, Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you came to save us. One of my favorite verses that Jesus says is, Jesus says this, he says, the Son of Man, speaking of himself, because he often called himself the Son of Man, he says, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And then he says, and give his life as ransom for many, right? He gave his life as ransom. He, he came to, to ransom us. He came to rescue us. Why? It's what the Savior does. It's what the Savior does, right? And so Jesus is our Savior. Now let's go to Mark chapter 10. So from Matthew is just the very next book, Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verse 46. Then they reached Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples, let me read that again, and as the Savior and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. And a blind beggar named Bar Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. Now, now I want you to see something. This, this verse is filled with details, all right? Look, look at some of the details. Jericho, um, blind beggar, Bar Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, right? Sitting beside the road, right? Why all of these details? Well, well, the reason all of these details is because when the original readers of Mark read this, they're like, man, I'm from Jericho. I know Timaeus. Man, I know his son, right? I know Bartimeo, blind beggar Bartimeo. I, I know that guy, right? Others, man, I've, I've been to Jericho. And you know what? I remember on the way out of Jericho, right there by the road, there's always this blind guy that they put there and he's always begging for money. Man, I, I know what, you know, so, so it made them understand like, hey, this is real. This is a real story. Verse 47 says, 
When Bartimeo, we'll say it in Spanish, it's easier for me. When Bartimeo heard that Jesus, the Savior of Nazareth, was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Or he began to shout, Savior, Son of David, have mercy on me. 48. Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him. But he only shouted louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. I like this guy, right? They're like, hey, cállate. And he's like, cállate que nada. And he went louder, right? He's like, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Verse 49. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come here. So they called the blind man, cheer up. Right? Get up. Be encouraged is what they told him. They said, come on, he's calling you. 50. Bartimeo threw aside his coat, jumped up, and he came to Jesus. 51. What do you want for Christmas? Jesus asked. What do you want for Christmas? Jesus asked. My rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see. Verse 52. And Jesus said to him, Go, for your faith has healed you. Instantly, the man could see, and he followed Jesus down the road. <laughs> you know, when you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, more than any other miracle, I mean, Jesus healed people that were lame. Jesus healed people that had their hands withered. Healed people that had leprosy. Healed people that were deaf, that were mute, and people that were blind. And, more than, and, and he freed people that were demon-possessed. More than any other healing, the one that Jesus does over and over and over again is he heals blind people. He heals blind people. Right? Now, why would Jesus heal blind people over and over? Like, why is that the number one miracle? Well, first of all, because it's an amazing miracle. It is an amazing miracle to happen. And that's the power of God. Today, with, with so many doctors and medicine and science and everything we, that we know, it's a rare thing that happens. So let alone to see it happen, then we have to know, like, man, this is God, right? This is God doing something, God working. But the other reason that it comes up so many times is because it's, it's a metaphor, a metaphor, right? Now, what's a metaphor? Well, you, you eat it with a little bit sal, limon, and tajin. No, I'm just kidding, right? You know, a metaphor is um, something that like represents something or, or it's something that helps us to under, it's like an analogy that helps us to represent something. Uh, it's, it's similar to a simile, right? You know, that was funny. Uh, similar to a simile, right? You know, so, you know when, like when you're reading something, it's like this is like that, right? You know, and so this is the metaphor. The metaphor is that like blind begging Bartimeo, the lost are blind. The lost are blind. Without Jesus, you are blind. Right? This has nothing to do with what church you belong to, what religion you claim, you know, who's your pastor, whatever. Without Jesus, you are blind. Right? You're blind without Jesus. Look, I, look, I, I, I'm going to tell you. Some of you will know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of you have a family member, a cousin, a, 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 a niece, a tia, or something, right? You have a family member. And you're like, you know, their, their life is a mess, right? It's a, it's a full mess. Tell the president, I'll call him later. And um, your, your life is like, a, like, their life, I'm sorry, is like a full mess. And you're like, man, I don't get it. Why, why don't they just come to the, why don't they go to church? Why don't they serve the Lord, right? And, and, and you don't get it. Like to you, it's, it's clear as day. You're like, man, you know what they need? All what they need is Jesus and things will start, you know, falling into place. And you tell them, let's go to church. No, next time. Next, no, I'm busy. No, you know, whatever. All the excuses that they put. And you're like, what is wrong with this person? Maybe they were even raised in church. They might even know a little bit of the gospel. And they themselves, every once in a while, will tell you, nombre prima, I know I need Jesus. Right? Nombre primo, nombre ca, I know I need to go to church. Right? But then you're like, well, if you know, why don't you go? The reason they don't come is because they are, what? Blind. As a matter of fact, there's a portion in Scripture that says that there's like a, ba a band, like a bell around their eyes. And you see, they don't see the way you see. Right? 
because they're blind. They don't see the way you see. They're deaf. They don't hear the way you hear. And I'm talking about in a spiritual sense, right? In a spiritual sense. And I'm going to tell you something else. Some of us, some of us, holy rollers, some of us, Christians, some of us, primos, <laughs> hermanos, hermanas, we're in church, we believe, we've called on the Savior, and at one point our eyes were open, and now they're sort of blurry. Right? One time Jesus healed a, 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 a guy that was blind, and Jesus asked him, can you see? And the guy said, I can see. And he goes, I see men, and they look like trees. And so then Jesus uh, prayed for him again, and then he was able to see clearly. What does that mean? I can see, I see men, but they look like trees. It's like, I can see, but I really can't see. And we're not careful, man. We get so comfortable in church that before we know it, once again, we can see, but we can't see. <laughs> One of my nephews, uh, when he was a little kid, they took him to the eye doctor, and um, nobody knew, nobody knew. The homeboy needed glasses. And uh, they got him glasses, and when he put them glasses on, he said, Mom, everything is HD, <laughs> right? It's a high definition, right? And some of us don't realize that we're not seeing in high definition. Well, you see, it was a little blurry, right? A little blurry. So that's what all of these stories of blind means. Now, verse 47 says, when Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, Savior, Son of David, have mercy on me. Every time we come to church, I have the expectation that there's someone here that they're a one, right? The 99 would know what I'm talking about, right? If you don't know what I'm talking about, you're probably a one. Right? <laughs> we'll just tell you so you can feel good about yourself. You're number one. And, um, and so I believe like in every service that there's someone listening or there's someone here that, that doesn't have that relationship with Jesus, that they're blind, that they don't see what the Lord wants them to see. Right? I believe that. I believe that we all come to church and, and we are, are going through something. Right? We're going through something. We have several families present in this service that are going through, through horrible trials, through, through tremendous storms. Um, uh, we have a family present and, uh, uh, that, that, that Friday was able to meet with. And, uh, um, and, and, you know, I remember walking away from the meeting like, that's like something that happens in a novella, like, like, the, like the, the stuff that has happened, like, like hard to believe. The advice, el consejo, right? that I give that family, that I give your family, and that I give to anyone else who is in dire need of help, is do as Bartimeo and call on the Savior. His name is Jesus. Jesus, Savior, Son of David, have mercy on me because God has sent a savior and he's still in the business of saving. Jesus can make all the difference in your life. <laughs> Jesus can make all the difference in your life. Now, I, I like on verse 49, Jesus is like, man, call that guy over here. Who's that, who's that screaming over there? Yelling at me. Tell him to come over here. And they, they, they tell him, they're like, hey, cheer up. Come on, he's calling you, right? Hey, cheer up. Be of good cheer, right? Be of good cheer. Right? Hey, anybody come last week? Anybody was here last week? <laughs> last week, I, I shared with you, um, you know, I always like to share between Thanksgiving and, and that one weekend we have before we enter, to de enter December, I like to share like, you know, a couple of lessons I've learned in the past year. And I turned 46 this, um, uh, in, on November 24th, a couple of weeks ago. And so I shared with you guys five lessons that I learned 
in the last year, but because I turned 46, I went ahead and gave y'all a bonus. Anybody remember what was the bonus? Cowboy up. Cowboy up. That's what they told Bartimeo. He's like, Jesus, uh, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus is like, man, tell, tell him to come over here. And they came in, they said, yo, cowboy up. Right? Get up. Because as Proverbs 24, verse 16 says, the godly may trip seven times, but they will what? Get up again. The reason that the godly are able to get up again is because God has sent a Savior and the Savior still lifts his people up. Get up, cowboy up. I don't know how you came to church. I know that some of you came and, and, and you're tired. Some of you came and you're sick. Some of you are sick of being tired. Some of you are sick and tired of being sick and tired. Some of you want to quit. Some of you feel lost. Some of you feel deaf. Some of you feel blind. Cowboy up. The godly, the righteous may trip, may fall seven times, but they will get up again. The Savior is still saving, and He's extending the invitation to you to receive His salvation. It's a tremendous gift, tremendous gift. Let's open up our Bibles to Proverbs chapter, I mean, uh, Romans chapter um, 3, as we prepare to finish, Romans chapter 3. Now, I'm going to tell you that, that we have, we have, a, we have a, a real issue going on. And the issue is that some people have not received the gift of salvation. And the other issue is that some people don't appreciate the gift of salvation. And so, so, uh, so I, want, I want to share on this a little bit before uh, we finish today. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For everyone has sinned. For all have sinned. All, me, you, all of us have sinned. What is sin? Sin is when we don't do what God calls us to do. And sin is when we do what God forbids us to do, all right? We all have sinned, all right? For all have sinned and fall short the glory of God, all right? We fall short of the glory of God. You, you ever gone somewhere? You know, we went uh, last night uh, after church, me and a couple of musicians and some volunteers, we went to Whataburger, Whataburger and, um, and we went to Whataburger and I was like, man, I, I got it. Uh, you know, when they ask, like, you know, separate and they're like calling someone else. I'm like, no, 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 man, right here, man, I got it, I got it. And then when, when the thing came up, I, I reached and, and, and I, had a 10, I had a $10 bill on me, right? It was like four of us, right? And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm a little short, right? I'm a little short. Look at, look, look at me, I had my old visa, right? And the chip still works, right? But I, I was a little short. When you and I sin, we fall short the glory of God, of God's standard. You might be close, but as they say, close but no cigar. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says that the wages of sin, I'm sorry, chapter 6, verse 23. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says that the wages of sin is death. Let's pause right there. The wages of sin is death. Every time you and I sin, we go into debt, D-E-B-T. We go into debt. Let me tell you, the older you are, man, the more in debt you are. And that debt is that, that we owe death. And my dad, he used to teach us that death means separation. Right? When Adam and Eve first sinned, they, they lost their innocence. They were separated from their innocence. Then God is like, let's get them out of the garden before they eat from the tree of life and become like us, live forever in this state. So they, they're kicked out of the garden. They died in the relationship that they had before that with God. Right? Then over time, physically, they died. So there was a separation that they had with God. Then later, physically, they died. There was a separation from their spirit and their body. What does this mean for us? Look, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you that one day down the road, all right, one day way down the road, you and I, one day we're going to die, all right? Amen. I pray that for you it'll be when you're 120 years old, right? That you'll be like Moses, 120 years old. I'm like, man, my knees are already hurting. I don't, wanna, I don't know if I want to wait that long. But anyways, um, and when you die, when you close your eyes to this world, immediately you will open them to another world. And it's one of two places. One of two places. Either or... 
know what I'm saying? Either you open them, you don't want that, or you want that. Right? Man, I'm just going to tell you straight up. I'm going to be playing around with you. All right? You're either going to go to hell or you're going to heaven. I mean, it's just that simple. You either go to hell, you go, and there is not, you, if you go to hell, man, your, your, your family cannot come and tell, Pastor Ruben, you know, we just give a little extra right here. You know, you do a little special prayer and scoot them in. Like, like it doesn't work like that. Like it doesn't even work like that. It, some of you went to high school and you really didn't graduate. You had a 60 in pre-cal and you're a senior and you're like, is there any extra credit? It's like a week before school is out. Is there any extra credit? What? what? Why don't you do extra credit in the beginning of the year when you knew you were behind? Is there any extra credit? And, and what some of y'all went to a school where the teacher said, well, you know, you just bring a couple of um, canned green beans, canned corn, you know, for the food pantry, and I'll, I'll give you a few extra points. You had a 60, a few extra points, that's like 10 points, right? And your parents so proud that you graduated high school. <laughs> mira, ma, mira, con su diploma. Ese diploma no vale. No, I'm just kidding, right then. <laughs> yes or no? Yes. yes. All right. They scooted you through. The reason they scooted you through is because they'll lose federal funding for every student that they fail. So to make the school look good, the district to look good, they just scoot them through. My, my, my wife was a third grade teacher, and, they, and she would be like, the student's failing, and they would tell her, figure out how he's going to pass. Right? Third grade, don't know how to read. Figure out how he's going to pass. Figure out how he's going to add. Scoot them through. I can know scooting through into heaven. You're either going or you're not. And, and you know what? I'm going to tell you something that some people might find very offensive. Right? But if God is offering you the gift, because it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. If God is offering you the gift of eternal life and you reject that gift, well, you deserve what you get. You deserve what you get. Because God is offering you this free gift. Here's eternal life through my son, Jesus Christ. You know how insulting it is to reject a gift? I don't want it. I don't want it. I'm going to tell you something that in my office, in my office, I have, I have a gift for the mayor of Pasadena, uh, Jeff Wagner. His, his birthday was, I don't know, it was last month or the month before. And so I'm like, hey, man, get, get some things together. Let's give him a gift. So, of course, you know, sometimes the water flows a little slow. And so, okay, all right, pastor, we got the gifts. But there's one problem. What's the problem? The bag tore. I mean, I'm not going to give the mayor a gift in a gift bag that's torn. Give me another bag. So apparently, I guess all the bags were sold out in, in Pasadena or something because it took, a, took about two weeks to get another bag. And they're like, okay, pastor, now we got the bag and the gift is ready to go. Will you sign the, the birthday card? And they get the birthday card and it's all like with flowers, all feminine. I'm like, he's a man. Find me something with like a truck or a cuerno de chivo or something, you know, like, I mean, something like a more masculine, a man, you know, like, you know, like, you know, like, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, a, like flowers. And so I guess they were all sold out of, of cards in Pasadena because it took another two weeks to finally be like, well, we kind of, a, and even that card, I'm still like, oh, man, really? But you know, man, it, 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 time's gone by so much that now, like, I, I'm embarrassed to give him the gift for his birthday. So of course, it's being converted to a... Man, you guys are smart. <laughs> Save some money and be like, hey, Mary, got you something for your birthday slash Christmas, right? You know, and so now, you know, it's going to become a Christmas. Now, now we got to wait another two weeks because we have to find a Christmas bag. <laughs> Probably to wait another two weeks, be New Year by the time we find a Christmas card for him. But anyways, <laughs> y'all know what I mean, right? Y'all understand what I'm saying. That gift is of no use to the mayor because it's still in my office. It's of no use to the mayor because it's, it's, it's not in his hands, it's in the office. God's, God's putting a, a gift before you. 
But it's no use until you say, I will receive that gift. God today is presenting before you healing. Let you see or let you see again. Salvation, eternal life, new life, eternal life, and abundant life. But you have to be willing to what? To receive it and appreciate it. Okay? Because some of you have received it. Some of you never received it. So my, my consejo today, my advice is, is receive it, Papa. What are you waiting for? But some of you have received it, but man, you got it thrown in the closet somewhere or under the bed. I was remembering you know, years ago, I always like sharing this story. We, we, we do, like when we exchange gifts, we go from youngest to oldest. Um, at 8 a.m., the oldest came. And, uh, you know, and, and, and so anyways, we go from youngest to oldest. And one year, um, you know, the, the kids were opening their gifts. And um, the, uh, one of the younger ones, um, he, he opens what his grandma gave him. And it was pajamas. Pajamas, and he throws them. Right? So then he opens what his other uncle gave him, and, and it was closed, and he throws it. He, he was like about four, four or five years old. He opens what his parents give him, and it's like a nice outfit, pants, shirt, you know, shirt, and he like throws it. So they're like, well, here, here's from your Theo, Theo Rubin. So it, I, I put mine in a bag, right? So he puts his hand in, and it's kind of hard, right? So obviously, oh, man, yes, finally a toy or a game. And when he pulls it out, it's a book. And man, his eyes got so red and mad, and he's like, a book? And he throws the book, and he says, the only thing worse than clothes for Christmas is a book! And I was like, I was like, <laughs> here's $20 that we're supposed to go in the book, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, because cash is always, always a good gift, right? I, I was remembering that... Um, uh, when I, when I, I was at elementary, we, we were walking, we were in an Astros game, and there was a, a, a little billboard, and it was of a Porsche. And my dad, I was like, we, were, we were looking at it, and my dad goes, Mijo, you ever get a master's, I'll buy you one of those. And I was like, bet. I didn't say bet, because we didn't say bet in those days. But anyways, <laughs> I was like, bet, you know. Man, I went on and got two masters. He didn't buy me the Porsche, I'm going to tell you that much. <laughs> But, um, but he, 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 bought me, he bought me a real nice car when I graduated from my first master's. I mean, a really nice car. Yeah, I told him. I was like, Dad, I'm not going to make you, I'm not going to call you on that Porsche, but I'll tell you what, you, you can buy me this. And it was when Infinity G35 first came out, right? It was like, you know, so I mean, I had this nice little Infinity G35. And um, when I first got it, man, just these hands right here, these are the only hands that could wash that car. And then a, a buddy of mine, Marco, he opened up this uh, car wash, and, uh, and a kid from our church was working there. So I was like, well, I'll take it to the car wash, and only Chevel can wash my car. So just like that. But then over time, I was like, man, get, get, man, just go through the machine, right? Then over time, it was like, man, it's Pasadena. It's all it's potholes. It's always dirty and muddy and water, man. I, I, I just wouldn't wash it, right? And later, I got a truck, and I never wash my truck. I mean, it's a truck, right? That's what it's for, right? Like that. But, you know, y'all know what I mean. When you first get that vehicle, you all yeah, nice and shine. But then after a while, like, it just it kind of loses your attention. And sometimes we're like that with salvation. When you first, llorando y todo, like, you know, and, oh, thank you, Lord, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. But then years, you know, go, and, and all of a sudden, you know, like, like salvation, is just, I mean, you know, it's just not a big deal. No, it's a big deal. It's a huge deal. So it's an amazing gift that only comes through the Savior, Jesus. So I want to encourage you, if you've never received the gift, receive it today. If you've received the gift, take it out of the closet. Take it out from under the bed. Dale shine. Shine it up and learn to appreciate it. Let's close our Bibles, and if you can, let's bow our heads for a little bit. Thank God that you came today. Just, just start telling them, thank you, Lord, that I came to church today. If you're listening to this message somewhere, thank the Lord that you're listening to the message. I'm just curious if there's anyone present today that one, either you, you need to receive the gift of salvation. Or two, you received it a long time ago, but somewhere along the line, it ended up in the closet. And today was a reminder to appreciate the gift of salvation. And if you're one of those two people, I'm going to ask you if you would do me the favor of simply just raise your hand in an act of faith. Raise your hand and then put it down. I see you. God bless you. I see you on my left. I see you in the middle. I see you on my right. God bless you. God is with you. More importantly, God sees you. God is with you. God sees you. I'm going to ask everyone, let's, let's all pray together. We're going to pray what many would call a prayer of salvation. Repeat with me in prayer. Say, Father God, 
I thank you for your word. And today, I confess with my mouth what I believe in my heart. Your son, Jesus, he is Lord, Master, King of the universe, of this world, and of my life. And I believe with all of my heart that he died on the cross, was buried, and three days later, you resurrected him. And because I confess and believe this, I receive the gift, the promise you have for me, the gift of salvation. Let me appreciate it for the rest of my life. Let me pray for you. Father, I put Pueblo's church in your hands. I thank you, Lord, for the gift of salvation. I pray, Lord, that you would bless them, that you would prosper them, that you would strengthen them. That we would never lose that appreciation for salvation. Lord, I pray for those that today was the first time that they truly committed themselves to you. That you would send people to help them along the way. That if possible, Pueblo's church would be a part of that. But that they would learn to grow more and more in their faith in you through your son, Jesus. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Let's, let's thank the Lord.